I think this is probably a question that you can uh, that you can both ask. Uh, uh, sorry, answer. Um, what is your key piece of advice based on your experiences in in your respective projects? What was the one thing that um, you'd like us to take away um, from your presentations? Um, so for me, I'm Angela. For me, um, when I think of this past experience, I'm you know limited in deliberation tool. So I'm. I'm still a product manager for other CFI tech projects at products at this moment. So my key key piece of advice to myself is that I'm not only building a a product, I'm building a solution. And that solution may include offline mechanism and may include negotiation with the government that may include efficacy as a part of the solution. So that make me um, not only think, see the product as a so the digital product, like an app or a website as a ultimate goal of my project, but I will work more with the government and the CSO to see what's the main impact that we want to make in design the solutions as a whole. Yeah. Great, thank you, Angela. Uh, Nima, what, what's, uh, what should our takeaway be? Uh, right, so I think even for us, it was a lot of realizing the position that we're coming from. In a lot of the countries, women didn't understand what online gender-based violence was. And so we had to go into each country and contextualize the question. Um, I think my advice to myself in the past would be to do more of that context building and because um, we tried as much as possible to tailor the tools to each country but I think that there's a lot more work that can go into that even after giving this talk I think yeah there's so much to contextualize in any of this work that we do so I would have spent more time doing more in-country research figuring out what are the right kinds of words to use and then taking it from there. Great, that's um, that's really interesting and just um, another one for you Nima. Um, I'm I'm assuming it. Um, the question is, have you examined the intersections between online misinformation and GBV, which I'm going to assume stands for gender-based violence, but if, so, if it was different, please let me know. But yeah, I think that one's meant for you, Nima. Yeah, um, we haven't looked at that yet. We're actually doing a project with Mozilla on misinformation right now, but we haven't looked at that intersection, though it is very interesting. Cool. Yeah, because it, it's a huge, it's a huge area to, to be looking at, isn't it? Just trying to narrow down your research questions, I imagine, is, is a yeah. huge task. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Angela, um, question here um, from Ricardo Poppy. I know Gov.0 was using the Polis tool with great participation. How did this kind of use relate with sense.tw? Um, there are lessons learned on this specific case. Um, so yes, at the very beginning, we do think of police model, and we do we do think that um, at the later stage of Sense TW, we can explore our cards and argument statement into police for people to vote on and form a cluster group. But um, why we develop Sense TW is also we see that um, on polis people cannot give the reference or why they are thinking of that. And people cannot directly respond or build on the mutual understanding of facts. And yeah, that, that's the main problem because, um, so let me give an example. Um, like the first thing problems in the US People who believe that fasting is good and people who believe that fasting is bad, they base on the different reading materials they read. So just voting on agree and disagree and see the different cluster groups doesn't help the mutual understanding and discussion. People should read each other positions, reasoning and the reference that can generate more discussion that 
Great. And just from, again, Angela, from uh, another question for you from Robert Bjornsson. Uh, when you say no one used the hypothesis tool that you were talking about, um, did you actually do online marketing at all to let people know that it was that it was actually there and it was available? Um, and if you if so, how much money did you spend on that? So it's a tricky problem because within the government project, we couldn't do much uh, online marketing budget because of government budget constraint. And second of all, when we first use the uh, fork version of hypothesis, it's a uh, to be model we, because we so focus on the government side of meeting. So at that time, we feel like uh, advertising to many people is not the best way. Uh, the best way is to contact a key person in the government and convince the government and think text to use our product. And we do write like we do. We did inbound marketing, like write blogs, or uh, we use that tools in other government meetings to do that. But within government budget, it's hard to allocate budgets for online marketing. <laughs> right, yeah, I, I totally <laughs> understand. <laughs> and I think many other people here will as well. Um, Nima, sorry, I'm losing my headphones. It's been a long day. Um, Sorry, Nima. Um, actually, this is a question that I'm quite interested in as well. Actually, when you were doing the research, um, did you see any differences in countries that have many multiple ethnic groups in comparison to ones that are fairly homogenous? I don't think any of the countries that we did were fairly homogenous. I think every single country we went to did have quite a difference, but no, we didn't collect granular data going down to ethnic groups. I don't think we thought that was very right to do at that time. But yeah, as you said, there's so many questions that we could ask. <laughs> Lifetime's yeah. work. We did see differences. Um, we did ask income. And you could see that there were very clear differences in income and how people um, reacted to their digital security, like how concerned they were and what kinds of behaviors they had and took. But yeah, we didn't have questions on ethnicity or things like that. Um, cool. And I mean, this is, you know, this is a horrible question to ask because I'm sure you don't have the answer. And if you did, then you'd probably be absolutely rolling in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, some an anonymous question here. How do we make more women or minorities um, to be the developers and designers of the actual technologies that they use? Yeah. I, I mean, of course, the answer is obvious, you know, there's the pipeline getting more people to be um, designers, developers, but also, um, I think just listening, I think there's a real listening problem. And, you know, running a running a small company in Africa, I see that all the time where people come from the West, and they're just like, I can't, I can't hear you. Like, <laughs> It's just that they never listen. And I, I think that's the biggest thing is that when you come and if you if you bother to ask us and we tell you then please actually take that advice and use it so i think just paying attention listening asking questions i think even that because of course the pipeline and all that is going to take many many years but i think listening can happen right now and I, I think that more of that needs to happen and of course having these conversations having these dialogues um creating space for this to happen online offline i think that's really important and of course, I mean, across the tech industry, it's it's a bit contentious whether you, um, you know, you try and push more women forward into more prominent roles just so that, you know, there, yeah. there are um, there are recognizable female faces out there. Um, and yeah, no one solved that argument yet either. Have they? <laughs> um, brilliant. OK, sorry, I don't want to cut into everyone's break um, again. Much, there were more questions on the slider that I've been, able, than I've been able to ask. So we'll pass those on to the speakers and hopefully um, we can get back to you with some answers. 